Today we're continuing in our series looking at the big story of the whole Bible from Genesis through to Revelation. And today we're going to be doing a deep dive into Leviticus. I know, right? I mean, it's everyone's favourite book, isn't it? Um, as I said previously, in, uh, when we were looking at Acts and Acts 15, the apostles felt led by the Spirit to ask non-Jewish Christians to obey the laws within Leviticus that are for resident aliens or foreigners living among you. So in your readings this week, perhaps pay special attention to those sections. And you see that, you know, that's just summarised of in Acts 15 and the apostolic decree there. As we look at the animal sacrifices, it's worth noting that God in history works with people within their cultural setting. God could have spoken to Bronze Age Israelites and said, I know everyone else around you is offering incense and they're offering sacrifices, but I just want your obedience. Why don't you just assemble once a week, have you know half an hour of music, followed by a Bible reading, Torah reading, and then just get someone to explain it. Why don't you just do that? God could have done that. Um, that would have been very weird within a Bronze Age context, and God didn't do that. Rather, he lets Israel approach him in the language that they already understood, incense and sacrifice. God accommodates down to our level, and God chooses to communicate with Bronze Age people in Bronze Age ways, so that people can understand and they can respond to him in a manner that they understand. And throughout his dealings with Israel, God continues to tell them through the prophets that obedience is better than sacrifice. And in Psalm 51, verses 16 through to 17, we read this. Certainly, you do not want a sacrifice or else I would offer it. You do not desire burnt sacrifice. The sacrifice God desires is a humble spirit. O oh God, a humble and a repentant heart, you will not reject. So God, through the prophets, through the Psalms, is trying to shift people into a new understanding about what he is like and how he's fully revealed in Jesus of Nazareth. For a moment, I think it's very important to talk about what sacrifices actually are. And I've said some of this before, but imagine you're a stone, you're in the Stone Age. You're a hunter gatherer tribe. You're just walking through a forest somewhere and then you encounter another group of humans. You've got a, a number of options available to you. You could attack them. You could take all their stuff or you could offer them food, offer them hospitality, perhaps join together, form an alliance or, or peace or do some trading. That's the very heart of what sacrifice is about. If you come across a spirit in a certain place, you can't kill a spirit. They're far more powerful than you, but you could befriend them. Sacrifice is uh, not about the killing, but the eating. It's about fellowshipping with spirits, getting them on your side to help with your issue. So the main purposes of all sacrifices then is to offer hospitality to spirits through rituals, to keep them friendly, to keep them on your side so that they will fight in your battles. So what we're discovering through places, uh, through archaeology, through like 12,000 year old Gebekli Tepe in Turkey, is that the first centres of human, human civilization are built around ritual sites places of pilgrimage for hunter-gatherers. Historians used to think civilization came first and then religion came out of civilization, but it's actually the other way around. Humans encountered spirits, they built shrines, those shrines became pilgrimage places that then needed round-the-clock care, which caused towns and cities and farm to develop around those ritual sites. So temples then, we should understand, as kind of like guest houses for spirits and those who want to eat with them. You would offer a roast lamb and spirits would get the blood and the fat as their portion and then you would eat the meat in the temple in their presence sharing the meal. They have their portion, you have your portion. And that's true for Israelite religion as well. So if we have a place like Ezekiel 44, 
we read there in Ezekiel um, 44, verses 6 and 7, Say to the rebellious of the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says, Enough of all your abominable practices, O house of Israel, when you bring foreigners, those uncircumcised in heart and in flesh, into my sanctuary, you desecrate even my house, when you offer my food, the fat and the blood. You have broken my covenant with all of your abominable practices. And so here we see the concept which the translator is getting at is that God is describing the blood and the fat as his food. It's not because God's hungry, but because that's what sacrifices are. That's what they're about. They're about fellowship. They're about communion, which is why the apostles tell people not to eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols. They don't want Christians fellowshipping with demonic spirits. Paul says you can't eat at the communion table and then at the table of demons. You've got to choose which side you want to have fellowship with. And within the Levitical system of sacrifices, there's a number of different types of offerings. There's incense offerings, sin offerings, peace offerings. And these offerings are often given for very sp specific events or circumstances that are taking place. And as I've said, if primarily sacrifices about feasting and sharing food with God, it's not about the killing, but the eating. You kill it only so that you can eat it. Then the killing is not the ritualized part, but the eating is. It's about fellowship. It's about mending a broken relationship. Say you have a falling out with someone at work and their relationship is a little bit strained. One way to resolve the situation might be to go out for a meal together, chat about what's happened and how we can fix it. And if things are going bad, it might, might be a steak meal, you know, take them out, get them the works. But if things are going very bad, you might need a whole oxen. OK, it's an oxen sort of dinner because things are in very bad repair. Um, so. You might have to pay a bit more, go to a nicer, more fancy restaurant. And we need to see sacrifice in these terms. Often a sacrifice is described within Leviticus as being a pleasing aroma to God. It's cooked. It's literally burnt on, on the fire. Um, and the blood and the fat are given to God as his portions. There's other things that are also offered. There's oil grain, wine. These things aren't killed because you can't kill them <laughs> in that sense, you know. Um, so again, sacrifice isn't about the killing, it's about the eating. That's why you do sacrifice wine, it's why you do sacrifice oil, it's why you do sacrifice grain, because it's about the eating, not, not the killing, if you understand. Uh, it's like having a big barbecue with God. In a world where blood represents life force, the Israelites are saying, you know, hey God, the crackling, you know, the fatty bit is the best bit. So that belongs to you. And since you're the source of life, here's the life of this animal also returned to you. It's blood. So the fat and the blood belong to God. At Passover, for example, the lamb will be slaughtered at the temple, uh, parts of it given on the altar. And then the rest is given back to the family so they can go home and eat it and have fellowship with God. Part of it is on the altar with God. But the other half is with the family. So they're eating it with God. It's a meal that is shared with God and the family. OK, so one of the major differences between a sacrificial meal offered by Israel and the pagans around them is that the sacrificial system in Israel also has this ethical dimension. Since every single human is an image of God, how you treat another human is a religious act because if you're treating it you're doing it to God because they're an image of God so pagans for example they won't let you desecrate their temples they don't want you offending their gods by defacing an idol or something Israel didn't want to desecrate another human being because they're the image of God God doesn't want his image defaced so how you treat another human affects your relationship with God because they're his image. So part of how we understand sacrifice is also linked to how we understand sin. Often Paul and the Bible talk about sin 
not sins. And this is important in Genesis chapter 4 verse 7. Cain is told sin is crouching at the door. It desires to dominate you, but you must submit, you must subdue it. In the Bible, sin is often presented as this power or force that is active in the world, like a disease. It has a corrupting influence. Um, and we commit sins when we partner with sin. We, like Cain, allow it to dominate us, which is why Paul in his letters talks about, you know, we can either partner with sin or we can partner with the spirit and use the spirit to put the power of sin to death in us you know so that we've got these options am i going to cooperate with sin and its power or with the spirit in its power you know how you live your life and the levites are not hanging around in the tabernacle waiting for chaps you know noah saul you know isaac or whatever they might be called to come in with some lambs because they've happened to do something naughty sin offerings are constantly continuously being offered in the tabernacle Let's just think about sin as a disease. Suppose someone's caught COVID. We might socially distance from that person so that we don't catch it. And we'd also clean the things that they've touched so that they don't spread the virus onto other people. In exactly the same way, the blood of sacrifices is spread around the sacred space, the tabernacle, the temple, to cleanse it from the pollution, the disease of sin that people bring with them just naturally into the area, into the holy place. And blood represents life. And so in a worldview of these Bronze Age people, it's the best cleaning product. You're literally splashing life, a life force everywhere. You know, um, it's silly bang, eat your heart out. You know, Mr. Muscle, you know, not a touch on that. The idea is for God to live among his people, a sin-free area, a sanitised area, COVID-free area, as it were, needs to be maintained because otherwise God is going to break out. His holiness is going to consume the camp, um, which God doesn't want to happen. He doesn't want people to, to suddenly be overcome with ho the holiness of God that he can't live with them anymore. Or he's just going to have to leave like he does in the exile. So they had to keep cleaning up this sacred space, splashing blood on it in order to keep the sacred area clean so that God could dwell there. Often we think about the sacrifices are thanking God for things, particularly grain and wine offerings. Thank God for the harvest. Let me take you out for dinner. Thanks God for the birth of my son. Let's have a roast dove meal together on me. Uh, you will notice that the priests also get to eat the meat, and so does the person offering it. And the, the idea is having this shared meal with God and his representatives, the priesthood. In Malachi chapter 1, verse 11, God speaks of the nations turning to worship him. And he says, my name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. And Christians from the very, very earliest time have taken this passage to speak of Holy Communion and incense as a symbol of prayer, like we find in the book of Revelation, where prayer is rising as incense before God. The Hebrew word for pure offering here is translated elsewhere as a meal offering in Exodus 30 verse 9 or is the grain offering in Leviticus 9 verse 4 and so the word used to describe the meal sacrifice without blood it's a bloodless offering um, and so within rabbinical Judaism itself the expectation is in the coming messianic age sacrifices will cease but the thank offering will never cease so for Christians, the concept of a thank offering of grain and wine lives on in the fulfilment of Malachi's words as Holy Communion. And the earliest name for communion is Eucharistia, meaning thanksgiving. One early Christian, Justin Martyr, uh, that's not his surname, it's what happened to him, um, writing about 155 AD. So that's 212 years before the final books of the New Testament were finalised. 
writes regarding this passage in Malachi, he says, This speaks of the Gentiles, namely us, who in every place offer sacrifices to him, the bread of the Eucharist and the cup of the Eucharist, affirming both that we glorify his name and that you profane it. So Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 16, Is not the cup of thanksgiving, the cup of Eucharistia, uh, for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? The meal itself is a cup of thanksgiving. Another first century Jew, Philo of Alexandria, described the Passover as a festival of thanksgiving. He writes, this festival is instituted in remembrance of and is giving thanks, Eucharistia, for the great migration that they made out of Egypt. So in the same way, the Christian new Passover, the Eucharist, the communion, since we've been set free in Christ from bondage of sin and death and hell. The real difference, however, is that the person asking the other person to go out for the date has been reversed. In Leviticus, it's human saying, thanks God for the harvest, let me buy you a meal. This is God saying in the new covenant, I'm going to provide the sacrifice and the food. Come and eat with me. The roles have been reversed. One a very, very old Christian communion hymn uh, goes like this. Let all mortal flesh keep silence. It says, Christ our God to earth descendeth, our full homage to demand. King of kings, yet born of Mary, as of old on earth he stood, Lord of lords in human vesture. In the body and the blood he will give to all the faithful his own self for heavenly food. And the idea at the heart of sacrifice is that by sharing a meal, the fellowship is restored. Okay, you make up over the meal. That broken relationship is mended over the shared meal. And that's why, and Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot have a part in the Lord's table and the table of demons. The question is, who are we going to eat with? Christ himself says, come and eat. Let's restore the relationship. It is Christ himself who offers himself as food for us in the body and the blood. There's bread and wine. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 15 to 18, Paul writes, I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourself what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving that which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? And Paul's point here is that Israel ate the sacrifices and so had fellowship with God and with one another in exactly the same way as we who are in the Messiah eat his flesh and blood and so are united with God and each other by eating of the sacrifice. So in Paul's words, we who are many are one body because we all share the same loaf of bread. So in conclusion, friends, you're invited to a banquet. Christ has provided the food. He gives himself as bread and wine to restore our relationship with the Father. He's a high priest and he offers a sacrifice of himself. Come and eat. Come to the table of the Lord. Come and have fellowship with him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the sacrifice of your Son for us that we receive as bread and wine. And we thank you that we're united with him through the sacrifice, that we have the forgiveness of our sins, the cleansing on the inside as the blood sprinkles us on the inside, cleansing us from all sin, and that we are his body because we share in the bread, and that we're, for, we're his image in the world. Let us live out that calling this week. Amen.